you find yourself wanting somebody to admit that they are wrong, already the energy is in the wrong place. Are you ever doubting that they're really happy for you? Why don't we want to follow this guy? And the reason, because he was arrogant and he didn't listen and he didn't give us any ownership of everything. Everything was about him. I mean, with a smile, you will be shocked how much you can change somebody's demeanor. When people start treating us differently because of that first impression, then we start to act differently. So now, when we can explain each other's sides, we can stop the scope creep of the argument. We can keep things just to the facts. I know about humans that the more they're being defensive, the more they feel attacked, the more they feel attacked. I know that their self-esteem is on the line here. This feels like an attack on them as a person, not an attack on their ideas. So even though for you, this is about just, we're just discussing facts here. For them, their whole worldview may be under attack and they're not going to be able to acknowledge that. So if this is an issue where you have to achieve common ground and you can't just say, you know, I've essentially I've tried, and walk away and save yourself that aggravation. If there's some reason, like this is a business discussion or we're talking about raising how, how we're gonna raise our kids or whatever, where there's no way to just agree to disagree and walk away, like we actually have to come to a conclusion. Then when you're in that moment, asking questions can be really powerful. So if somebody makes an assertion, then just say, what's that assertion based on? And then if they're like, they're giving you something that's feelings, then what I will do in a moment like that is I'll say, I just want to lay down some, you know, base assumptions or parameters that we can agree on. And then I'll say, can we agree that neither of us are experts in this field? Yes, we can agree on that. Okay. Does it seem sensible for us to appeal to an expert opinion on the subject? Yes, it does. Can we mutually agree on who an expert is? Now, if we can agree on who an expert is, as defined as somebody who's had success in that area three times or more, then it's like, okay, well, let's go see what the experts say on this, or let's get um, multiple experts. We'll pick three of five and see if you know there's consensus on the issue, or if we're in a company, if there's somebody else in that company that's a recognized expert in that field, what do they think? But some way to lay essentially the groundwork for how we're going to determine what is and isn't accurate. How do we break up with a friendship when it's been too long? And the biggest thing that happens with friendships is they do go stale. And that's a very weird thing to say, but there are people, I'm sure you could think of someone in your life where every time their number pops up on a text message, you're like, ugh. It's been a while, I better call them. Or you know, you see them out of convenience or out of location. And I think that those are the kind of friendships that really drain you. There's actually a study that was done on ambivalent relationships. Yeah, this is so interesting. Yeah, I'm thinking about ambivalence a lot. So toxic people, we get it, right? We all understand that we wanna get rid of toxic people. That's more obvious. The real danger, I think, is ambivalent relationships. So these ambivalent relationships are the people where either you don't know how you stand with them, so you don't know if they like you or not, and they're also the people where you don't know if you really enjoy hanging out with them or not. Have you ever had that? Yes. And you're like, Am I, is this gonna be fun? Was that fun? Is this fun? Mm. Um, and I think those are the ones that take the more energy. There are also the more dangerous ones because they tend to yeah. creep in and stay in. Mm. So the whole notion of frenemies I find really, really intriguing. And this is something certainly that I've dealt with in my life. And yeah. it was weird to me how until I read that, that it didn't register why that would be so insidious. So what the study, what the science says, they did a, a research study with police officers and they asked police officers to identify the amount of toxic people in their workplace and the w w amount of ambivalent people. And they found that the police officers who had more ambivalent relationships um, were sick more often, had less happiness at work and didn't like their job as much than police officers who had toxic people. So Just weird. Just think about that for a second. And the reason for this is because if you have a toxic person, boundaries are easy. They ask you to go out to lunch and you're like, no thanks, right? Like you know it's a no thanks. Whereas if an ambivalent person asks you out to lunch or asks you to their birthday party or you know, asks you to work on something, 
it takes this mental energy where you have this thing where you're like, Ooh, like, will it be good? Would I rather eat alone at my desk or would I rather have lunch with this person? And it, when it's not always easy, that's an incredible drain on our emotional energy. And if you are an introvert or an ambivert, an ambivert is someone who is kind of splits between extroversion and introversion. Yeah. Your energy is finite and our mental space is finite. And this is something that I did not realize until much more recently. I thought that mental space was sort of endless, right? You could learn forever. Um, you could think about things forever, but actually we only have a certain amount of mental time every day. And if we're dedicating that to trying to figure out if someone likes us or not, which is a very important thing. We all like to be liked, whether we admit it or not. That I think is a waste of mental energy. Why would we want to spend it towards that? And that's why I think ambivalent people are more dangerous. Do you have a checklist? Cause I'm like thinking back to the people that managed to become frenemies in my own life. Mm -hmm. It's kind of scary how long it took me to be able to put that label on them to like yes. sort of wake yes. up to the fact that either they always were or the relationship had evolved to that. Like years, right? Years. I know. So I don't have a checklist. It's actually just one simple question. All right. Sarah. Are you ever doubting that they're really happy for you? Wow, that cuts right to the heart of it. I mean, that's it. And that, that happens actually quite often. Like there are these people who make these very passive aggressive comments where you're like, was that nice or was that mean? <laughs> if you're ever questioning that, that means they are not truly happy for you. Or if you have a piece of really good news, they, a really true good friend will mirror and match that excitement with you. Someone who's not as happy for you will come in with dream killer questions. You know dream killers? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Dream killer questions are when they question your success, they doubt the success, they think of all the negatives. And dream killers are not always bad. I, I have dream killers in my life, and I call them when I need someone to poke holes in a business idea. Mm. Right? Like, I'll pitch them because they're great practice. But I know that they are not the people that I go to when I have something I'm truly excited about. So that that's the only question you have to ask yourself. And it might be an inconvenient truth. My second platoon, we have a, a great platoon chief, we have a great platoon LPO, we have a great assistant platoon commander, but our platoon commander, the guy actually in charge of the whole platoon, he's not very experienced. He had come from a different job in the Navy, so he didn't have a lot of experience, and which is fine. Like, it's okay to be inexperienced as a leader. You can get through that. As long as you're humble and you listen and you take advice from other people, you're gonna, you should be able to do fine. No one expects you to know everything as a leader. But he didn't do that. He didn't listen. He didn't take advice. He didn't take guidance. Everything was like his way or the highway. And eventually, we in the platoon got kind of fed up with it. And we had a mutiny inside of our platoon. We went to our commanding officer and said, hey, sir, we don't want to work for our platoon commander. He, he doesn't listen. He's arrogant. And eventually what ended up happening was this guy got fired as our platoon commander. And that left an impact on me because as I'm watching this going, I'm thinking to myself, why don't we like this guy? Why doesn't anyone want to listen to this guy? Why don't we want to follow this guy? And the reason, because he was arrogant and he didn't listen and he didn't give us any ownership of everything. Everything was about him. And that would, that would have made an impression on me. That, that would have left a mark, but the mark got left even more clearly because when that guy got fired, the guy that came in and took over for him was, was like, I hate to use the word legendary, but he was a pretty legendary <laughs> SEAL, had a ton of experience, he'd come up through the ranks, and he had been stationed at every different kind of SEAL team, and he took over as our platoon commander. And I kind of thought to myself, well, he's going to take over because we're a bunch of mutineers, and they need to put someone really strong that's going to, like, whip us back into shape. So I was anticipating that we were going to have this super hardcore guy. And, and this guy shows up, and he's got a nice smile on his face and he's super humble. And I remember the, one of the first things he said to us was like, I look forward to working with you guys. And I was, it, it, the, the, that word right there, I'm gonna work with you guys. Not, not I'm in charge, I'm glad I'm taking over, I'm glad to be your commander. It was nothing like that. He said, hey, I'm looking forward to working with you guys. So all of a sudden it was totally different. And he started putting us in charge of things. Instead of him coming up with a plan, he would say, hey, you guys come up with a plan and let me know how you wanna do it. And all of a sudden we had all this ownership and that made me reflect on the way the first guy had acted compared to the way this guy had acted. And I realized how important it was to be a humble leader and to listen to other people and to give ownership to other people. So that was the second platoon. And then in the third platoon, the story that I tell is we were, it was a good solid platoon and we had a good platoon commander and we were out in the desert doing some training and, uh, 
some targets popped up. It's just fake. It's just it's not war. But we start engaging the targets like we're supposed to, and everyone gets in the prone position and is returning fire. And I did what I had been doing this whole time, which was detach. I kind of took a step back, took, shot a couple rounds, then kind of pulled back and looked to see what was going on. And I saw the call that needed to be made. And I gave the platoon commander a couple seconds to make a call, and he didn't make it. So, you know, I, call, I made the call, peel left. And everyone said, okay, peel left. And we peeled left, and we left the scenario, and we got our distance, and then we stopped the training exercise, and we did a little debrief. And during the debrief, the platoon commander, you know, he said to me, well, why did you make that call? And I said, well, I could see what we needed to do, you know, and you hadn't made a call, so I, I you know, I, I made the call. And he goes, well, I actually didn't want to peel left. I wanted to assault the target. And, and, and right there in that split second, I kind of thought to myself, well, like part of my ego flared up and I was kind of thinking, I, I could have said something along the lines of, well, you need to make a call faster. If you're not going to step up and lead, then I'm going to do it. Like I could have said that. But I realized at that moment in time, wait a second, I didn't need to make a call. The, the problem could have developed more. But for some reason, I thought that I needed to be the guy. And I said, no, you know what? You don't need to be the guy. Your leader, you need to support your leader. And it's not about you. And so that right there also changed my attitude because then from then on in my career and in my life, I realized, hey, I don't always need to be the center of attention, which is what our ego wants us to do. Our ego always wants it to be about us. And it's not about us. It's not about us at all. In fact, in a situation like that, where the platoon commander wants to do something, maybe he sees something that I don't see, maybe he's got a different strategic objective that he wants to accomplish, and I'm undermining that. And what does that do to our platoon? Hey, it makes me feel great, because I think, oh yeah, I might not be the guy in charge, but I'm out here making the calls. That's your ego. And what you have to do is subordinate your ego and be supportive of the person that's in charge, and you move forward together as a team, because that's what it's about. It's not about me, it's about the team. I like Jordan Peterson's idea of tell the truth or at least try not to lie. Sometimes there can be a truth that we leave unsaid because this is a momentary interaction where I would say kindness is the higher value than pointing out every flaw that we see or every bit of obnoxious behavior because at some point it just spirals into madness to point out every misstep that somebody is doing. And so when I look at somebody that is being obnoxious, being rude, my goal is to shift their energy. How can I get them back into a place where they're feeling good, they're feeling warmth, they are in a place where they feel kind, right? Because most people, it isn't that they are incapable of kindness. And if they are, like imagine how shitty that life would be. Somebody who never experiences kindness, joy, warmth, connection, that would truly be its own hell. So I'm not going to worry about pointing out every obnoxious thing that they're doing. And I would play a game with myself of how much joy can I spread? And in some ways, you are leaving a truth unsaid, which is that they're being unkind or obnoxious or whatever. But by trying to spread kindness, you're not lying. And especially if you share that value with me of wanting to just put as much good vibes into the world as you can. And look, I'm not perfect. And there is no doubt that sometimes people are just like, God damn, like I just don't want anything to do with it but that doesn't feel like me at my best. Me at my best feels like, all right, cool. Can we switch this energy around? Can we get them to soften, to feel that human warmth and a bit of connection? And can I, I mean, with a smile, you will be shocked how much you can change somebody's demeanor. So that's how I would flip it. I would just see how much joy can I spread even when people are being problematic to me. Now, that doesn't mean that I let people abuse me or anything like that, I don't. I imagine you guys can get a, pretty good guess about uh, what I'm like. I don't let people walk over me or be a dick to me or whatever, but I find it far more interesting to try to change somebody's energy than to get them to go, yeah, I am being a dick. That's just not interesting to me, trying to get them to sort of confess that they're the problem. I'd much rather hold myself accountable to like, how much sort of emotional jujitsu can I do here?
Emotion should never stop you from achieving your goals. So if you feel stuck, overwhelmed, low on confidence, you're beating yourself up, or you feel like you're not deserving of the things you want in life, I have something to tell you. Emotions are not facts and you should never let them hold you back. And yet I find that people do this all the time. They mistake that feeling for objective truth and it sends them in this downward spiral. Reaching greater levels of success in life means knowing how to use your brain. And if you're in a rut right now, or if you've been struggling for a while to achieve your goals, then I've pulled a class from Impact Theory University to help you get back on track. It's called Six Steps to Getting Unstuck, and it's for anyone who wants to know the exact steps to achieving big goals when life puts challenges in your way. If you want to check it out, go to unstuck dot impact theory.com to get access it's a free preview all right guys i'll see you on the inside now let's get back to today's episode or that's why you have to understand human nature right because you have to understand and and believe me like my deployments to iraq i was 30 plus years old my last deployment to iraq i think i was 34 35 years old but that's me i'm a 35 year old man with a wife and kids I have guys in my platoons that are 20 years old, 21 years old, 22 years old. I need to pay attention to them because they're going to have less insight into the world. And so it's going to be challenging. So what we, that's what we do. That's what leaders are there for. So we as leaders, we have to constantly look at that and say, okay, I've got that going on and, and, and I need to control it. So, when people start getting emotional, when, when guys get killed, how do I get control over that? Yeah, I absolutely have to control my own emotions because it's your guys. And believe me, when you lose one of your guys, you wanna kill everyone, everyone. And you know you can't, and you know you shouldn't. So you have to detach from your emotions, you have to get control of them, and you have to make sure that you lead your, your men in the right direction so they don't do something that is not the right thing to do. Do you feel yourself getting agitated or flustered a lot? Um, Because I don't think people set out to be difficult. I think what happens is their insecurity gets triggered. They're, they feel like they're being attacked. They're, you know, like one of the most just gnarly positions to be in is to feel like you're supposed to think this way and this is supposed to be your stance and you can't really defend it. It makes you a little bit insecure. And so when people come after you and you know that like you feel like you're being outmatched intellectually, oh God, like you just launch in with ad hominem attacks and you make it personal and you, you know, it's name calling. It's, oh, this person's an idiot, whether you say it out loud or internally. And if you find yourself in that position, feeling like that, feeling agitated, feeling defensive, then odds are that you are being difficult because difficult isn't about I'm setting out to be a jerk. It's, ooh, something has triggered an insecurity in me and now I'm not at my best. I'm not at my most compassionate. I'm not at my most open. I'm not at my most friendly. I'm not trying to elevate other people. I'm not trying to spread joy and warmth and all of that, right? I'm defensive. I feel like I'm you know, in a sort of intellectual boxing match. I'm, maybe I'm trying to win. All of that stuff is exactly what it feels like to be the difficult person, right? And that's what's so fascinating about this is we all think the other person is being difficult. When in reality, there's probably something that we could have done differently to have that exchange go in a completely different direction. And instead of focusing on how difficult that person is being, asking like, how could we do a bit of emotional jujitsu in this moment and get the kind of outcome that we want? So having that self-awareness, understanding the body sensations that you're getting, being able to interpret them, and then ideally being able to dial them back. So this is really a, a, the ability to build the self-awareness around, <clears throat> excuse me, around the emotions that you're having. And uh, there's a book called How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett that goes into great detail about how you can do that. And I highly recommend that book. In Western cultures, mm. there is an ideal personality type. And you will notice that every romantic comedy, the woman is the ideal personality type for women, and the man is usually the ideal personality type for man. So in Western cultures, for women it is high in conscientiousness. So that, that's sort of her funny quirk. Mm. She's really organized yeah. and doesn't like to be spontaneous. Yeah, yeah. Um, a high in agreeableness. So yeah, whatever you want, sweetie. Um, 
either medium or high in neuroticism, so kind of a warrior, but it's cute and endearing. Right. Um, uh, very spontaneous and extroverted and bubbly, and um, high in openness, adventurous and imaginative. That's like the perfect diode. So the problem is, is when you talk about neuroticism, neuroticism should not be a negative word, but it is considered negative because then you're called A-type or controlling. Right. Um, and so it's funny, language is actually a huge issue. So conscientiousness does not mean that you don't care about people. Right. It just means that routine is not your, your love. Like, like some people. So anyway, at, at the lab, we're trying to figure out if we can guess people's personality types mm. or solve their matrix based on their different assets in their You're house. Doing good so far. Yeah, so uh, we're gonna ask people for that. And then um, the funny one is what's on your walls? So we've got the Michael Jordan flu game, okay. which is probably my most meaningful piece of art. Okay. Uh, it's all art, so I guess we'll start with that. Okay. And then mostly movies. Mm. So Matrix has like three or four appearances yeah. in the house. Um, and then that's pretty much it. So what they say is, uh, this is a research according to Sam Gosling. He wrote a great book called Snoop, which is if you're a snooper, this is the book for you. Um, so Sam Gosling found that um, high neurotics use more motivational quotes. So I am a high neurotic. I'm, I'm definitely a worrier. Um, and by the way, you know if you're high neurotic or low neurotic if um, you're really good at what if scenarios. So high neurotics, we love pros and cons lists. Mm. Um, we can think through every worst case scenario ever. Um, whereas low neurotics, they say things like, it'll all be fine which to a low neurotic is like right. the worst thing that you can say <laughs> because we believe that worrying is like an investment account. So the, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So like the more that I worry, the less likelihood it will happen. Right. That um, is interesting. So, motive, so high neurotics use, I still love motivational quotes because it's like an external regulator for their internal world. There are definitely times where I am focused on explaining why I think I'm right. Now, when I do that, whoever I'm discussing with, because they know my stance, right? Don't worry about being right, just try to find the right answer. Now, what do you do when you're not worried about being right, but you really believe you have the right answer? So now you're in this pickle, right? So I'm not worried about them admitting that they're wrong. If you find yourself wanting somebody to admit that they are wrong, already the energy is in the wrong place. So now, if you're trying to explain to somebody why you're right because it matters, now when it doesn't matter, that's the time to just let that shit go. But if it matters, right? Again, how we raise the kids, um, what should we do with our finances, uh, who are somebody we're working with, how they're engaging, how we talk to our boss, whatever. Things where it's like, okay, the outcome of this thing actually does have consequences, and so we have to see this through. Okay, so first of all, if I think that I'm right, I'm going to present my case. I'm gonna be as succinct as I can. I'm gonna recognize that communication is difficult, that I have what I call base assumptions. So what I'm trying to do is get to the point where we're being understood. So we're doing the steel man thing, right? So now I'm gonna say, all right, I'm gonna to try to make my explanation as Simple as I can, because if you understand it well, you should be able to make it quite simple. So if you find that you're doing run-on sentences and you know four-minute rants trying to get them on board, you may not understand it clearly enough yourself. So you may be speaking so that you can be understood. Sorry, so that you can understand yourself rather than so that you can be understood. And recognizing when you're speaking so that you can understand is very important. So I'm gonna state it succinctly. Then I'm going to ask them if they can steel man my argument. Now, if somebody is discussing this with you in good faith, then they should be able to generously present your argument back to you. Now, if they can't, you'll at least understand which part of it is that they're missing. Now, once they can steel man your argument and they can say as articulately as you what your position is, and then they say, and I still disagree, and I disagree for this reason, now at least we know what we're arguing about. But the problem is when somebody's bringing in a new topic or whatever, people just let the like scope creep go. They're like, maybe they're getting confused as well. And so in those moments, what I do is I just take it on myself and say, look, I'm getting a little bit confused. So I'm not 
sure where you're going with that. There may be a completely valid reason why you're bringing that thing in. I don't yet understand it. I'm worried that you may not fully understand my argument, which by the way, maybe be because I'm not explaining it well. So if we could, I'm just gonna quickly state my whole thesis, right? Super succinctly, like in a sentence or two. And if you can't do that, you don't understand it well enough. So I'm gonna give it to him in a sentence or two, and I'm gonna say, can you repeat my stance back to me just so that I know that we're on the same page. And that is one way to keep the argument grounded so that as they begin reaching for something else, we call it out generously. Not like, what the fuck? Why are you bringing that up? That doesn't have anything to, right? That posturing matters and forces everybody into these more and more defensive postures. So with that generosity, the true desire to understand, you're gonna take it and break it down piece by piece. And that's the key. Let's just take it one piece at a time. Here's my thesis. This is why I say this. This is why I think this is right. What's your thesis? Okay, that's your thesis. That's why you think that's right, right? We have two conflicting views. So now when we can both explain each other's sides, we can diffuse that situation. We can stop the scope creep of the argument. We can keep things just to the facts. If we reset our body language, our nonverbal communication to create a positive first impression, then we don't have to think about it much anymore. Because the problem is if you say, all right, sit up straight, have upright, open, confident, positive body language, then I go into a, a meeting or a networking event and this first thing that happens is I reset to my defaults, computer mode, right? Because I'm not thinking about it anymore. It's a conscious shift in my body language that I will lose control of. So we have to delegate or relegate that set of nonverbals to a subconscious process. And the way to do that is to practice it. And the way to practice it is to remember to practice it. And the way to remember to practice it is to do it every time you walk through a doorway. So whenever you walk through a doorway, stand up straight, shoulders back, chest up, chin up, smile on your face, and you don't have to superman it. You'll look, you'll look awkward and fake. But if you just have open, upright, confident, positive body language every time you walk through that door, you will start to do this habitually. The problem is we tell you this and the first thing you do is you walk through a door and you forget it instantly because you learned it on impact theory along with a million other things and it goes right out the window. So take a pack of post-it notes, these little tiny ones. You don't have to write anything on it. Stick them up at eye level in the door frame or in the doorway of your office, your home, wherever you can get away with it. And when you see that, you're gonna go, why is there a post-it, oh right, Doorway drill, upright, open, positive, confident body language. Now that over time, weeks, months, whatever it takes, you will start to do that every time you walk through a doorway. The beautiful part of this is our first impressions are often made as soon as people see us and as soon as they see us is usually when we walk into a room through a doorway. So every time, if we're resetting our body language, every time we walk through a doorway, we're creating a positive nonverbal first impression every time we enter a room and then we don't have to think about it anymore. So we can stay present in conversations, we can get through what we need to get through in a conversational agenda if we have one, we can network and meet people and have it look natural, and we don't have to think, all right, oh shoot, you were slouching, stand up straight, oh crap, what was Tom saying? I forgot, oh no, now he knows that I'm lost, wait a second, I'm slouching again. That's what we're trying to avoid. We just wanna make sure our nonverbal first impression is good. When people start treating us differently because of that first impression, then we start to act differently and we start to become essentially a different, more confident person because of the way that other people treat us. Because the way other people treat us informs the way we feel about ourselves. And then we don't have to fake it anymore. We don't have to try hard. We don't have to put on airs, you know, respect me. We don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to do that. I think all of us have a desire to be looked at favorably, especially by the people that we care about, that we respect. But you have to, like Viktor Frankl said, understand that there is a gap between stimulus and response. <clears throat> and in that gap, you have the ability to choose something as a way of reacting that isn't your 
emotions dictating that. So you're gonna have an emotional reaction. When you do something and people disapprove, almost certainly, certainly happens for me, you're going to feel that sting of like, oh, that sucks. I really wanted people to be behind me. I really want people to cheer. I really want people to clap for me. That's amazing. But at the end of the day, you've gotta be able to say, what is my goal? and what reaction to this stimulus actually moves me towards my goal. And that needs to be the thing that overrides everything else. So step one is having that clear goal, knowing what you're trying to accomplish. And then step two is the ability to assess whether or not your emotion, that which is the subconscious speaking to your conscious mind. So if you think of emotions as the subconscious, which um, processes data in a faster and vaster, as they say, fashion, meaning it can process a whole lot of information that your conscious mind would not be able to process through rapidly and it can do it much more quickly. So it coughs up instead of speaking in the language um, of that little voice you actually hear articulating words in your head, it's coughing up an emotion. So it's all of that experience, all of the things that our brain does to make sure that we protect ourselves, that we don't get ostracized by the group, which makes sense in a evolutionary context, but not so much in a modern context. That's why the subconscious is speaking in emotion. But you can take that emotion and say, hey, this doesn't make sense for my goal, feeling badly about myself, worrying about what other people think about me. It's only gonna slow me down. It's only gonna hold me back. I need to be able to trust my instincts, which I have trained, and now move towards what um, my goals demand. And so when you're able to do that, when you're able to read the emotion, check to see if there's a lesson to be learned, but if there's um, in wallowing in that emotion, if it's gonna move you away from your goals, then you set that to the side. And practicing that and getting good at that and filtering everything to your goal is how ultimately you're not going to um, spend a lot of time caring about what other people think. And so the savior for me has been the belief um, and the part of my identity which says I only do and believe that which moves me towards my goals. So obsessing over negative thoughts about what other people think doesn't, and so I just let it go and move on. And it literally comes down to what you allow yourself to think about. So just stop yourself using cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, stop yourself from thinking about what other people think.